Illinois faces some big challenges. Today, you're about to hear a truly honest analysis of the problems we face. Equally important, you'll also hear an in-depth discussion of some practical solutions. This is your radio source for stories, the insight, and the answers you won't hear anywhere else. Not in the media, and not coming from Springfield. You're listening to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Opportunity Project. Now, here's your host, AM 560's Dan Proft. Welcome to another edition of Illinois Rising. I'm Dan Prop, co-host of Chicago's Morning Answer, weekdays 5 to 9 a.m. on AM 560 with Amy, Amy Jacobson. And uh, joining me is Ted Dabrowski, who is the president of Wirepoints.com, a uh, public policy outlet that uh, produces original work to assess all of the challenges facing the land of Lincoln and the city of Chicago within it. And the big challenge uh, profile this week became an international story was the violence over Lollapalooza weekend, 12 dead, 74 shot. Uh, the culture of violence, I, I, I don't know if there's a way to put a, a finer point on it than the story CBS did profiling one of those killed. His name, Earl Young, murdered by a neighbor over puppy pee. Young was murdered Friday, one of 12 killed over the violent weekend. Payne says it all stemmed from Young's two puppies on the porch of his South Shore home. And the puppies were peeing on the porch. And the pee ran down the porch into the neighbors. Police say Young and the neighbor below exchanged words. Then Young was shot and killed. He was 30. How petty are we now that we're living in a world that you could lose your life over puppy pee? How petty indeed. Obviously, most of this is gang and drug-related crime, but not all of it a bigger cultural problem and oh by the way as much as people have focused attention on this and it generated the pro forma pressers from tiny dancer and eddie johnson and the deployment of more police on the south and west sides of the city and the rehashing of all this kind of heal neighborhoods heal the community stop the flow of guns from indiana pablum that you get from the same old uh, men and women that run the city and form its power structure I went back and looked at some of the numbers for this year alone. And this is down from 2017. This year alone, uh, we've averaged 1.6 murders per day in Chicago and about 8.4 shootings per day. So what you saw last weekend was basically the average carnage we get on a weekly basis. Uh, So... When Rahm said this week that this isn't Chicago, no, it is Chicago. It's the Chicago that we've begotten. Uh, I hate to break it to you. Heather McDonald uh, in the City Journal had a good piece this week, uh, Shooting Up Chicago. She's the author of Bestseller War on Cops. And she recounted a couple conversations she had, federal prosecutor here and a Chicago police detective, 24 years on the job. The federal prosecutor told Heather McDonald, the city is lost. We've never had crimes like this downtown, people getting shoved and robbed at 3 3 p.m. It's just brazen. Uh, Police detective, 24 years on the job, said, the kids who are mobbing downtown are the same ones doing the carjackings. This generation of kids has grown up with no one daring to touch them. For more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by uh, one of Heather McDonald's colleagues at City Journal. He is Rafael Mangual, the deputy director of legal policy at the Manhattan Institute who uh, had a piece on uh, Chicago's violence as well in City Journal this week. Rafael, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, you try to address uh, in your piece uh, at uh, City Journal why uh, Chicago can't get a handle on the shootings we're discussing. Why do you think? Well, I mean, to me, the biggest thing that jumps out is how many of these shootings and murders are being committed by repeat offenders. I mean, if you look through the data, um, it seems like every other shooting is committed by someone who has been in custody of the Chicago Police Department at some point in the recent past. And what that tells me is that, you know, the city's major failure here is not identifying the people who are causing trouble, but it's keeping them behind bars which, you know, goes against the grain of the, you know, the current tone in the criminal justice reform movement, which is, you know, really pushing de-incarceration. Um, and what we see in Chicago is that, you know, at least in some cases, sentencing and pretrial detainment practices are probably too lenient, not too harsh. And that's how you can explain the fact that 
you know, someone who's arrested with a submachine gun ends up back on the street, you know, a few days later to be arrested again. Now, does that mean, uh, Rafa, that, that, that the, the laws and rules in Illinois and Chicago are just way too lenient compared to what you've looked at versus uh, New York and, and Los Angeles? I mean, I find it striking that, that we can have more murders than Los Angeles and New York combined. You know, what's, what's, what's the problem with our brand of crime? Uh, is it because we're just too lax on on that, you know, keeping people in jail? I mean, that's definitely a, a, a big part of it from what I can see. I mean, New York has, has among the longest prison stay lengths, um, you know, than, than any state in the country. And I think that, that helped push its crime down. And, you know, the studies that were done, you know, uh, about the sort of increase in the rate of incarceration during the 90s show that, you know, the increased rate of incarceration had a significant role in the in the overall decrease of, of violent crime around the country. And, you know, Chicago just doesn't seem to be doing that job. And people are getting out um, way too quickly. I and, mean, you know, occasionally the Chicago Police Department will put up a Facebook post sort of promoting, you know, one of the uh, arrests that it makes, um, you know, and it'll show some pictures of the drugs and guns they recovered. Um, and so back in back in April, I, I, I found one of these Facebook posts, and, and they, you know, posted a picture of a submachine gun, some other firearms, a bunch of drugs and money that they recovered during the arrest of a guy named Kendrell McCurry. But 12 days after that post, McCurry was arrested again for dealing drugs. And then two weeks after that arrest, he was arrested on the same charge, which means that within a matter of days of that arrest for guns and drugs and illegal cash, this guy was back out on the street. And, um, you know, that that's not an isolated incident. You, know, you look through a lot of these major arrests, you, you find out that these guys have, have been arrested five, six, 20 times before. And, you know, that that's just an unsustainable model. So, you know, I, I know that a lot of people at the national level have been talking about, you know, how too many people are being detained for too long pre-trial and that sort of thing, but there, there's definitely a, a subset of the criminal population that that we're being way too lenient on. Well, and then those are where arrests are made and crimes are solved. And one of the other issues we have in Chicago, and I haven't looked at the comparison, the comparative clearance rates in other big cities, but uh, you know our clearance rate on capital cases on murders is uh, consistently under 20 percent, sometimes under 10 percent, and so. Obviously, not catching shooters uh, is me- a message to the, the, that small segment of the population that are predators, that are violent criminals, that uh, I can do whatever I want, I'm going to get away with it. Exactly. And, you know, and part of that, you know, I think, is just the size of the Chicago Police Department. You know, um, it, it strikes me as, as undersized. Um, you know, I think they have between 12,000 and 13,000 officers. Right. Uh, but it's a pretty big geographical area that they have to cover. Unlike New York City, for example, the population isn't as dense in Chicago, especially in the, the high crime areas, which is also goes against the grain of something else that you hear. I mean, a lot of a lot of people, you know, crime is pretty concentrated around the country. And, you know, some of the things that people say in response to that is like, oh, well, it's concentrated in the places where the population is. But if you look at Chicago, the most densely populated parts of the city have some of the lowest crime rates. I mean, most of the population is, is concentrated, you know, from the loop up through the north side along the water, um, and the population density is much lower on the south and west side, but the south and west side is where you're seeing most of the violence. And so when people are spread out, you need more cops. Um, it, it's, it seems to me that Chicago could use a significant number of, of, of police, and that, I think, helps explain at least part of why the clearance rate is potentially so low. And then the other part is just, you know, this no-snitching ethic that, that pre- prevails in, in these communities. I and mean, people just aren't willing to talk to cops. I mean, I've, I've talked to several police officers and departments in different cities around the country, and, and they say the same thing. You know, it's, it's really hard to get cooperation from the community. Well, and the other, one of the interesting things this week, too, Eddie Johnson, the police superintendent here, uh, trying to... Um, I think, uh, do the bidding of the mayor and uh, assuage the anxiety of uh, much of the city's population made the point that uh, the uh, violence, the shootings, pretty much contained in four of the city's 22 police districts. And that may very well be true, but 
Um, the idea that Chicago police would be pursuing a, a policy of containment, George Kennan style, uh, with uh, the kind of carnage that uh, is piling up in those four police districts is rather a jarring statement to hear from your uh, lead police official. No, that's, ex- that's exactly right. And, you know, what, what that statistic tells you, though, is exactly how bad things are for those communities to whom the police department has an equal responsibility. Yeah. You know, um, he's right to say that the crime is uber concentrated in Chicago. I mean, I've, I've done uh, a study of this last year and, you know, Chicago, uh, when, when Chicago's crime really went through the roof and the president, uh, you know, tweeted that he would send the feds in to stop the carnage, a lot of the sort of left-wing intelligentsia was pushing back against this notion that Chicago was a uniquely dangerous city. I mean, you had, you know, people tweeting that, oh, well, if you look at, you know, the citywide murder rate, Chicago's murder rate's not even in the top 10. Um, you know, there are a number of cities that have lower, uh, you know, higher homicide rates. You know, people would say the smaller cities were had a, high, a higher murder rate per capita. And, and that's, that's true, but that doesn't mean that the violence in Chicago is, is overblown, because Chicago's a pretty big city. And so what I did was I, I looked at where 75% of the murders happen, and it happens in a, a pretty definable, contiguous geographical area that contains about 40% of the population. And the murder rate in that area is double what the citywide murder rate is. And so you know, these people use the, the citywide rate to kind of hide just how bad things are in the really bad neighborhoods. But the really bad neighborhoods are utterly insane. I mean, Chicago's citywide rate um, for murder in 2016 was something around 27 per 100,000. I mean, there are police districts uh, and, and areas of the south and west side where the murder rate exceeds 107 per 100,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's more than triple what the citywide rate is. I mean, it's, it's really, really terrible what's happening in those neighborhoods. And, you know, the people in those communities deserve you know, real policing that, that has been proven to work. The problem, though, is is that so many people push back against those tactics when they're undertaken. So, you know, I, I kind of understand the frustration and the demoralization that some of these police departments um, are experiencing. He is Rafael Manguel, Deputy Director of Legal Policy at the Manhattan Institute. You can check out his uh, piece uh, about uh, Chicago's inability to get a handle on deadly shootings at the Manhattan-Institute.org website and City Journal as well. Raphael, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.